How many people came to the talk I gave at Scala Sphere earlier this year? And not many. Not many. OK. Did, did you not go to Scala Sphere or did you find a better talk? Did, did, you, did you not come to Scala Sphere at all or did you, was there a better talk going on at the same time? <laughs> there's, there's no answer. OK. Um, so I will, I will explain to you a few of the ideas in Fury. Uh, I guess most people here use SPT. Is that fair to say? Does anyone use anything other than SPT to do yeah, builds? Gradle and Logic. Use Gradle, OK. What do you think of Gradle? It's OK. I guess it's not the biggest problem we have. So. <laughs> OK. So, as, sure. so as, as the problems go, it's not the biggest one. Yeah. Um, you're familiar with SBT as well? Yeah. OK. So, so everyone here, I think, has at least some experience with, with SBT. And it's, it's kind of unavoidable in, in, in Scala. Uh, as, as you may know, I've, I've been a little bit, no, I've been very disappointed by some of the um, user experience uh, I, get, I get from SBT. And it's not just a single thing, it, it's, it's a variety of different reasons why it, it's just not that pleasant to use as a, as a tool for building Scala. And fundamentally, I believe that building Scala should be quite simple. It's not, a, not generally a complicated task to chain together a few compilations in the right order. And that's, that's essentially what I'm doing. For any, for any build I have that's going to produce a jar file or, or class files at the end, what, I, what I'm doing is working out a few sources that need to be comp compiled in some order with a class path some, some binaries that um, they depend on, feeding the output of one of those compile phases into the next phase, and running that entire graph of, uh, of compilations so that at the end of it you get something produced, some software that you can use. And with Fury, I've, I've taken... Um, I've made a lot of decisions up front with how I would design it. And I've, I've, in most cases, I think, I've taken the opposite decision from the one that SBT used. So whatever SBT did, I did the opposite, but with, with some justification. So I think, um, I, hadn't, I hadn't really decided how to do this. I think what might be best is if I demonstrate uh, how you can use Fury in its current state. And its current state is in development. I've not made any releases yet. This is my own private work. It changes from day to day. Yesterday, it was a different piece of software. Um, I did some work on it this morning, broke some stuff, fixed some stuff. I'll show you what's working today. Um, my goal is to have a release, a private beta, I think, release in a couple of weeks. Um, fingers crossed. And then maybe two weeks, four weeks after that, I can make a, a public release. Uh, Maybe I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. So, you use Fury from the command line, from the normal shell. And you can, you can get going by just, just saying Fury start. That starts the server in the background. And let me just check. Yeah, that's all running. Uh, so what I can do is I can create what I call a workspace. And a workspace is... Um, it's essentially a folder on your hard disk where you will do some work, where you will write some code. So let's, let's make a new folder. Um, so the crack of Scala user group, let's, let's call it KSUG. So new, new folder, I'm, and I'm just going to call Fury init. And I just need to type in my password there. Uh, and a few things happen when I do that. This directory becomes a Git repository. So it initializes a new Git repository. And if we look inside there, a file appears. Now, this file is essentially the definition of the build. And if you're, if you're familiar with using SBT, your idea of definition of a build is some code which you run, 
or sorry, some code which you compile and then run. And then after all that's happened, you know more or less what to do. With, with Fury, I use pure data to represent that build definition, which gives me many advantages and a couple of disadvantages. The disadvantages are that I can't do arbitrary stuff. It's not a, a, a Turing complete language. It's just data. If I can't represent what I want to do in the data format, then it, I can't do it. So my intention is to represent as much as possible that is, that is useful. Um, but there are also many advantages as well, which you should see over the course of the next uh, four to five minutes or so. So we've got this file called workspace.fury, and I'll just, um, I'll just show you what's in there to begin with. It, it's quite empty. It's only seven lines. Um, because we've, we've got basically an empty definition. It's a shell of a workspace with no projects, uh, no, no compilations defined yet. So let's actually start to create a, a new project. And to make any changes to this file, I'm going to run a few commands. So I run commands on the command line. The file will change. So um, remember, this is, this is a Git repository. There's a Git directory. So any changes I make will be modifications to the working directory, the Git working directory. I can stash them or branch or do anything like that. It, it's, it's all under Git's control. And you, you, can, you can use Git commands as well to, uh, uh, to, for example, to stage changes if they work and then un undo them, go to an earlier, or ro roll back to an earlier commit if you want to. These, these are all possibilities. But to get started, I'm going to say, um, I'm going to type fury project. In fact, if I, if I type fury and I press tab, it gives me a list of things that I can do. And you can, you can read through this list, and there's, a, there's useful instructions as to what each one, each one does. Some of them are more interesting than others. Um, the interesting ones are build, uh, module project, schema, and workspace. Yeah. Uh, I have a stupid question. Uh, so what happens if you didn't start the server? Is the possibility for automatic starting the server? Yeah, stop, start, and it seems like... Uh, yeah, it's a good, good, um, it's a good point. Uh, I could probably do that. Yeah. Um, so when I... Uh, I mean, if I do Fury stop, um, the server is not running. So if I, if I now do Fury and then press tab, there's only one completion, which is start. So if I start it again and then press tab again, everything comes back. Um, it would be possible in, because I've, I've got a wrapper script, just a shell script which wraps the, uh, the um, it runs behind Nailgun, which is why there is a server. So I don't know if you're familiar with Nailgun, but it, it allows you to run Java software very fast, or invoke, invoke a, a main method very fast in order to, um, to do something without the JVM startup time penalty. So that, that, that's why I'm, why I'm doing it this way. But you're right, it, it would be possible, I think, to automatically start the server. Um, maybe problems arise if the port is already in use or there's some other issues. But um, at the moment, it's kind of explicit. So I was going to say Fury Project. Uh, and you'll see that the commands you type in are um, commands and subcommands, and, and potentially deeper subcommands after that. So I'm going to add a new project. And we get some, uh, some parameter options as well. All we need to provide for the project to begin with, uh, what should we call this project? Any good names? What's it going to do? Simple. Simple, OK. Um, so I've, I've got a new project. Uh, and it says the current project is now simple. So one thing you can learn from this is that there is a concept of a current project. So within a workspace, there's a current project. And well, I've, I've, made, I've made this change. Uh, if you look at a git diff, you can see that there are some changes in the file here. Um, we're, we're not going to look too much at the file. I just want to show you that the file is there. The format is quite simple. 
and the diffs are quite minimal. So the file format is optimized for readable, minimal diffs. What's the format? Is it a known format? It is a, um, it's a format called OGDL, or O-G-D-L, which is... It's, it's something like object graph data language or definition language. Uh, it's not that. It, it's something... One of those words is wrong, but it, it's... The, the format is OGDL. Um, it was actually quite easy to write like a, a 200 line um, parser and serializer for that uh, us, using Magnolia. Um, so it serializes to and from case classes quite, quite easily. Um, but yes, yeah, so it's a good question because, uh, I mean, why, why didn't I use JSON? Well, there's an issue with JSON, which is that quite annoyingly, um, you need a comma at the end of each line apart from the last line and then if you add an item to the list you get a, a sort of rogue diff an additional diff line that isn't really different it's just got a new comma um, and Good like, yeah, yeah, um, it's, it's, it's an idea it, it gives me more options than I want um, so for the sake of 150 lines of, um, of writing my own version um, I did it this way. So we, we, we've run this command, and there's not really any evidence now that anything has changed apart from this, this, uh, this git diff. Um, but maybe if I list the projects, we'll see that there's now a, a project called Simple there. Uh, it doesn't have a license, so maybe we should decide what license we're going to make this available under. So I'm going to say Fury uh, project, and then we'll do an update. And license is an option there. You can, you can change the license. And if I press tab, we get a, um, a selection of possibilities. You can, you can enter your own. But um, any favorite licenses, anyone? MIT. MIT, OK. And check that again. We now see that it's got the MIT license. So no, nothing particularly exciting. But you, you can see the interactions I'm making. You can see that. The, uh, the, the changes are uh, being made to this, this file. So you see the license is now showing... Oh, no, it didn't, it didn't add the file, no. Um, maybe, maybe that's a possibility to do later. Um, I would, I'm tempted to say it's not part of the build tool's responsibilities to modify the source files. Um, but I, 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 it's, it's not necessarily out of scope that I could read the license file if it's there, work out what the license is based on a, a checksum and then use that to... Yeah, because now somebody needs to add that. So we say mm. it's an MIT, but it's actually not, it's not yeah. added. Yeah, so, so one, one... I mean, at the, at the moment, having license there serves uh, no real purpose. But what I, what I would like to do is have some constraints on what licenses can depend on what other software. So if you have GPL software, then obviously the, the restrictions on what you can depend on and then publish. Uh, and that's, that's something that could, to some degree, be encoded in the build tool. Now, I'm probably not going to enforce those license rules strictly, but I, I can offer a warning to say that you're depending on, uh, you're, you're depending on something which you um, can't, under the license you're choosing to publish it under. So the other thing we notice is there's a modules option here which is empty and if I list the modules you can just do fury module and it will assume um, assume you want to list them we've got a, an empty table here with a few a few columns which uh, doesn't doesn't tell us much yet I should explain the difference between a project and a module a project is the sort of thing that is equivalent to a, an, a single SBT build distributed in a single repository in, in, in the SBT world. A module is always one run of the compiler, so one compiler invocation. So we're going to have several modules, typically we'll have several modules for each project. Uh, module in Fury terms is equivalent to sub-module in, uh, in SBT terms. 
Uh, except modules are much more lightweight. It's very easy to create a new module, so I'll show you how to do that. Uh, we can add a new module, and we need to give it a name. Let's call it uh, core. And as soon as we create it, it becomes the default module. And do you mind if I make this a little bit smaller? Can you still read that? Is there anyone, is there anyone who can't read it? Is that a thumbs up or a, or a, a, a thumbs up? Good. I didn't want it to be someone saying, it's me, I can't read it. And then I just carry on. So hopefully if I do that again, we can see the whole table. OK. So we've got one module. It's not very interesting. Um, but I'll just give you an overview of the, uh, the options we've got here. Well, not, not options, the, um, the things that define a module. So it's got a name. It has a type. Um, so let's, let's add a new module. Uh, now, my core module is presumably the main part of my simple project, um, but maybe it depends on some macros, and the macros have to be compiled first in order to, um, to be used in the core. So what I might do is add, uh, add a new module called macros, and there's a choice of type. And this is, a, this is a new feature I've added recently, which is why everything broke in the last couple of days. And type allows you to have different sorts of um, modules that are dealt with in, in different ways. They're all compiled, or gen generally they're all compiled, but um, th th there, are, there are some differences. So it can be either a library, an application, a plugin, or a compiler. Uh, a library is the default. It, it essentially results in a, uh, a jar file or some class files which you can use in, in subsequent modules. An application will be run with a main method. So you can specify what the main method is or the class of the main method, and that will be run. A plugin can be used as a compiler plugin. So you can have a module which compiles a compiler plugin like Kind Projector uh, or others. And then if you depend on that plugin, you can then use it as a, a parameter to a later compilation phase and that compiler plugin will be run. And you can actually define an entire compiler. Uh, this hasn't been shown to work yet. Uh, but Given that you can specify um, dependencies in, in terms of other modules, and other modules can be in the same project or in a different project, sources which are, so which are just source files, so those will be directories containing source files, binaries which will, if you, if you really want to use binaries, you can download them from Maven, or you, you can refer to Maven and it will Fury will download them for you and they will become available. Um, but I. I I do very much want to discourage use of binaries. Um, Fury is primarily a source-based dependency manager. It's, it's not, um, it aims to take advantage of source files as much as possible to have benefits for cross-building. I mean, it still means you have to cross-build everything multiple times, but um, source compatibility is, is uh, the question is whether, whether it's easier or harder than, 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 than binary compatibility. Uh, I, I would say that, or if you speak to Sebastian Duren, he will say that source compatibility is harder than binary compatibility. Uh, that might be true, but with source compatibility, you have a compiler which will check and tell you correctly whether something is compatible or not, and will, it will give you a compile error if it's not. And then you can put the time in to go and fix that. But you're not relying on runtime linking to hope that everything will still continue to link when compiled with different, different dependencies. So that, that I think is the, that, that's where the dispute over whether source of binary compatibility is, is better comes from. 
Uh, and I, I, am, I am very much in the source compatibility is better camp just because you get these checks. With, with binary compatibility, what, what tends to happen is you, you compile everything, you distribute it, mix it up a bit maybe, then you bring it all back using Ivy or Maven and hope that it all still works. You hope that it all links. With Fury, you never separate those sources. You never separate those binaries. If they compiled, if they compiled successfully together, then they will be run together and you would hope, therefore, that they would, they would continue to work. Um, so I'm going to make macros a, a library uh, and there, uh, I mean, I can specify a compiler, but I'm, I'm not going to because this doesn't, this doesn't work correctly yet. So let's add macros. And uh, let's say we can have one more. Let's see if we've got a command line interface. I like, I like command line interfaces. Now, there's no, there's no relationship between these at the moment. These are just independent modules which the compiler will compile. What I want to do is have one depend on the other. So we, we can do that. Uh, this little arrow here points to the current module. So again, there, there is a concept of a current module inside a current project. You can have multiple projects and multiple modules. And most of the commands that modify things will default, will use that as a default. And you can, of course, change that. So if I wanted to change the module to, um, so it's currently CLI, let's change it back to core. It's now, it's now core. And what I'd like to do is make core depend on macros. And then I'll have CLI depend on core. Any questions at this stage? You all okay? So let's have a look at dependencies. And we're going to add a dependency. And the dependency can be written in one of two ways. You can either write it as, if it's in the same project, you can just write the, the name CLI core or macros. I should probably remove core because you can't depend on yourself. But CLI macros can go in there. Or you can specify project slash module. Would that to specify core? Um, it, it will not complain yet. But uh, what, what I will do is have a, so a lot of the changes I'm making are doing quite naive changes to this uh, data format. What I, what I will do is before I, and sorry, ev every time you, you invoke Fury, it makes the changes and it re-serializes the file the disk. What I will do is have a verifier that will check that certain invariants, like um, that the graph of dependencies is acyclic, it'll check that that is all um, that, that 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 all remains consistent, and we, we don't end up with um, referring to things which don't exist or, uh, or 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 break in some way. So this would be a little bit like the um, the license thing, but c a custom. Um, no, no, I'm not going to do that. I don't think. Um, so th this this gives me an opportunity to talk about um, the ways in which I th I think this may be may be customized. Um, and, and the sort of things that I want to support and don't want to support. Because with SBT, I already said it's, it's a Turing complete language. You can do anything. You can build Docker images. You can connect to a database. You can download stuff. You can, you can do all sorts of things. And it's just, just code. If you want to do something, just write the code to do that. I don't want that sort of flexibility. I, I don't want that sort of liberty to, to do anything because it, it makes things harder. I have to check lots of things. I have to compile uh, custom things in order to, uh, I, I, I would have to compile them in order to uh, 
to make sure everything works successfully. If I'm very much in control, in control of a very constrained system, I can feel confident that it will work. So the, the condition for adding new features, um, which may include things, I mean, potential feature could be build Docker images. If I decide to um, allow people to build Docker images, if I, if I wanted to have something that, that in SPT would be provided by a plugin, in, in Fury, I will either decide to include that in the core application, have it fully integrated, not to have to work through some fragile plugin API that means that if I, if I decide to change Fury, then all of the plugins break and everybody has to upgrade. I don't, I don't want to be in that situation where there's that level of fragility. If I want to support Docker, then I will build that into Fury. Someone will give me a pull request, maybe, and I will consider it and then maybe say yes or no. Um, and and, and the, the kind of criteria I will use are, what, what is the, the universal use, utility? How, how useful is this feature to, to people? So Docker, not sure. I'm not sure yet. Um, something like ScalaFix, that seems much more useful to more people and could benefit most from being integrated into Fury. So running, running Scala fixes is something that probably will be part of Fury at some point in the future. There's another question, which is, can the, the extension, whatever that extension happens to be, can it just be run as another command line program after Fury? So can I build a Docker image by just running Docker build on a Docker file immediately after running Fury? Yes, probably. Can I write a make file that sequences those commands um, in, in, a, in a convenient and understandable way? Yes, probably. And I, I would suggest that it's not unreasonable to use Fury with make or with Gradle even with SPT, if you wanted to. You could, you could have SPT invoke Fury to do some work, and then SPT could do whatever it did before. Not, I'm not sure I want that. It would seem to me like an opportunity to stop using SPT, but um, I would uh, very much suggest that Fury is used as part of, as, as, a, as a small tool which does one job very well, sequencing compilations, that composes with other small tools that do things, do, do small tasks very well, composed with something like Make. That, that, that's my sort of alternative philosophy on how people could, could do their, their, their development work. Um, I, I went so, some way beyond your original question, yeah. Mikhail, but um, yeah. Can you add a remote module this uh, I'll, I'll show you how that will work later. Um, but that, that, that is obviously something you would, you would probably want to do, yeah. Uh, at the moment, we're just going to depend on... Uh, so the current module is core. Core will depend on macros, so I'll just type macros there. And if I want to add a dependency um, from the command line interface to core, I can actually just specify CLI and then the dependency core like that if I don't want to change the default. So we've got those dependencies there now. And if this were an SBT file, in order to work out what gets built at this point, we would have to compile the SBT build, debug the errors, and then run it. And then we would know what the graph of tasks was. With Fury, you can run Fury build, describe, and instantaneously... Oh, it doesn't work. What's going on? Oh, no, it does work. It does work. Sorry. Um, this will show you the graph required to build the current project. So if I set the current project... So, sorry, the current module to CLI, and I, I run that again. 
we see that it's just a simple build like that, which because we're just working with data, you get it instantaneously. Now, if I just temporarily show you a different repository. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Uh, so, um, it, it uses, uses tabs for indentation. Implements. Oh yeah, but you're not you're not meant to write it. It's human readable, not human writable. Um, and that that's that's kind of deliberate. I don't I don't want to use something that is I don't want to use a binary format because that's so opaque it's not useful. I want to very much discourage people from using their own uh, or, or just modifying this file by hand because I can't I can't control what people do then I can't control the constraints. Um, I can't, I mean, I, obviously you, you can still, you can see what I'm doing here, but I can like, I can change the name CLI to CLI2, or may, maybe, maybe worse if I, if I change core to core2, but now we've got a broken link. So I, I, I very much don't want people to be modifying this. Um, they can. The verifier that I haven't implemented yet will catch these problems if you try and change anything, but um, the, the intention is, is not to have this as a, a file that people change. But I, I mean, I, 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 can, I can show you the file occasionally to see how it changes and um, the, the, the diffs, I think, show you a little bit about the sorts of things that change. So you can see that maybe you can't see because it's too small, but uh, st st stuff has obviously changed in there. So let's let's go a bit bigger again. And I was just going to show you a uh, a different project here. Um, yeah, why not? Why not? I'll show you. This is this is the build for. Um, Several projects, so let, let, me, let me show you what's in here. This is a few of my own projects. If I list them, the, these are some, some projects I've set up. Uh, and the modules are listed for each one. So if I, if I select probation, which is my test library, I can list the modules there. Can you see that? OK, let me put it at the top. And you see, because we've got more stuff going on here, the, the table has expanded, so it, it's hopefully quite clear what, what are the rows and what are the columns. Um, I, I use a, a consistent color scheme. So you oh, depend yeah. on Scala source as the compiler? Uh, the, the, the sources of Scala, Scala compiler? No. Uh, so you, you saw Scala down there, is that right? Yeah, that's yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, if I select Scala, what you can see there is that there are no sources, but there is a binary. So, uh, and also the type of this is compiler. So, uh, and, the, and the compiler is actually none. Well, it was it was none for all of them, I think, but it but it makes sense there. So, this is a Maven string, and I will use Corsier to download. Download those binaries. The thing is, you. Well, okay. Well, well, this is. No, no, no. This is this is this is feasible. Um, and I know it's not going to be a common case, because. People don't often write new Scala compilers, but, um, by considering some of the more extreme extreme examples. I'm hoping I can handle the common cases um, better. So that if, if there is something that's just slightly too difficult, then there will be ways to, to improve it. So the Scala compiler is a module in a project like any other. 
It's a little bit special because it's not compiled, it's just pulling in some binaries. And because it has type compiler, you can depend on it as a compiler in downstream modules. So this is something you'd want to have, well, you, you'd need to have if you want to compile some Scala. Um, and you can specify compiler parameters as well. I don't think that works at the moment, but uh, you, you can add, add and specify and change the parameters. Um, I wonder if I had anything else to say about compilers. So, you so, were talking about color schemes. I was, so, yes, and I remember my point about compilers, then I'll go back to the color schemes. So, the way you refer to a compiler is as a module, project slash module. So, in this case, Scala slash Scala. The definition of Scala slash Scala can be changed. You can substitute a different value in or different module in. You could substitute in a value that is built from source if you can, if you can find a way to bootstrap the compiler. Yeah, so I, I that would be, be binary, I guess. So I, I'm, I'm not certain, but I think the current Scala compiler is built from a series of about five or six, maybe not quite that many, three or four earlier compilers, um, which bootstrap, in theory, from Java, um, step by step by step. Actually, no, it, 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 it might even be more compilers than that. So in order to compile Scala 2, you need a Scala 1 compiler. In order to compile Scala 1, and there's, there's about three different versions of Scala 2 that you need in order to, uh, to get to 2.12 or 2.13. Um, in order to compile Scala 1, you need a language... So M Martin Odersky did two, two other languages around the time of uh, or predating Scala, one called Funnel and one called Pizza. And I think there's a bit of a situation which is that Pizza, that there is a fork of Pizza which existed at some time on one person's computer, which was used to bootstrap Scala 1.2 or something. And that computer or that person are no longer available. So the only thing we have is the, the binary of uh, Scala 1.2. So I think if, if, if like the, uh, if, if the right server's in the right places and the right hard disks all crashed and everybody's copy of Scala got lost, we wouldn't be able to build it again from source. We might have the source, but we, we, couldn't, we couldn't build it. Um, anyway, in, in theory, with, with Fury, you could do that. You could have several staged compilers which refer to each other step by step and build, build Scala like that. And, and um, Dottie, of course, builds with Scala 2. So the Dottie source is compatible with Scala 2. So you can, um, we could, in theory, build Dottie with Fury. I'm, I'm not going to rush to provide that. Uh, color schemes. Um, so I, I try as much as possible to use um, consistent color. So modules are always blue. And this, this, this is true in, error, in well, error and information messages and, uh, and in output like this. Uh, projects are green. Um, I haven't talked about schemas, but schemas are yellow. Those are obviously projects. We know that they're, uh, it says projects up there, but we know they are just by looking at the fact they're green. And repositories are, are red. Um, what other things I've got? Now, there's, there's, there's a few other sort of entities that, that, that exist in, uh, in Fury, and you should become familiar with the color scheme after using it for a while. And hopefully it's all sort of little little hints to make things more obvious and to give you an intuition as to what is happening. Uh, so I wanted to show you the build for 
Well, let's describe the build for... Uh, well, Scala, Scala Scala has no dependencies, but if I select the project... Um, what's a good one? Probation, maybe. And let's, let's go for the, the command line interface. And that one's not so interesting. I wonder if there's... Uh, I want, I want to show you a, a more interesting graph. So this doesn't depend on Scala? Uh, so the dependencies on a compiler rather than on a library are currently not shown here, but they, they should be. Uh, that's an that's unimplemented feature. But yeah, good, well, well, well spotted. I wonder if um, maybe Kaleidoscope is more interesting. No. <laughs> um, I mean, what I could do is I could, I could make this uh, artificially more interesting. When I, was, when I was testing this out, I had some quite huge graphs and lines everywhere. That, but it would still work instantaneously, and you could, you could follow the lines and work out uh, what depended on what. So, I mean, CLI depends on like, the arrow... I don't know if you can see where my cursor is, but the, the arrow points back up to core. Core depends on both macros and on Magnolia core. Um, I, think, I think you get the idea. Uh, they, they just look a bit more... They're, they're a bit cooler when there's actually too, too much to work out just by looking at it. You, you can sort of follow the, follow the links. But I was going to look in this project. So we've got one project here. Now, someone asked the question, can I depend on external projects or uh, remote projects? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, in fact, I don't know if I, I think I'm going to do something else first, because I haven't shown you how sources work. So. Obviously, we've got a folder here that's a Git repository. We can create a directory, um, like source, and let's just create a really simple source file. That should compile. And what I want to do is, in order to to tell my module what I want it to compile, I need to specify the folder that contains the source. So I can add a source to the current module. Um, the current module is CLI. So who, who cares? Let's, let's add the source there. Uh, source, add, and then it's dash s. And <coughs> hmm. I thought that would offer me tab completion. What it what I will do instead is I'll just type in the uh, type in the the value I want, uh, which is going to be like that. And the source is now specified there. So, so when, when we come to compile this, uh, it will know where to look. If I wanted to add a binary dependency, I can add that with uh, binary add dash b. And then we have a, a, a maven string separated by colons. So. Uh, does anyone happen to know any Maven dependencies they might want to use? Let's uh, comprehensive um, contextual underscore two twelve. This won't do anything interesting anyway, except accept the string as valid and. We can, we can then see that the binaries includes contextual 212. And um, behind the scenes, you, you don't see this, Corsier will download that. What happens if you input here the wrong, uh, wrong Maven string? 
Uh, so one which doesn't exist. Um, you will get an error when you try to build because Corsier will, in the background, by the way, background downloading is something that um, currently works by default. It will be a flag. You can turn it off if you don't want it, but um, it, it, it will, it will realise when you come to try and depend on that, that there's a problem. Um, and if I list the binaries, you can see that it's, it's actually passed the string. It's worked out that this is the, this is the group ID, the artifact ID, and the, the, the version. And it's using Maven Central. So there is the, the ability to have other, other services where you can download things from. And this probably won't work because I, like I said, I broke everything. If I, if I run Fury Build, um, yeah, it doesn't, uh, doesn't, doesn't work. But uh, I use Bloop as the tool for doing the actual builds. So the fact Bloop exists was sort of what made it possible for me to, to write Fury. I, I think there's a huge amount of good work that's gone into Bloop to make it very, very fast to do, uh, to do compilations. And if you want to build something with Fury, Fury, you run a Fury build, and that will just call out to Bloop, and Bloop will do the building. What, what Fury does is it outputs some files in a um, in a dot bloop folder, and these are just some JSON which um, looks something like this, and this tells Bloop what it needs to do. So, if you'd like, you can think of Fury as managing these JSON files. All of the all of the commands you're running that modify that uh, that Fury build result in the generation of these these JSON files and Bloop then reads them in and runs what it needs to. So it's got things like dependencies here, uh, the names get encoded in a certain way, and the class paths get resolved, and all sorts of other things happen as well. There's mention of SDT. Yeah, that's, I don't know why there's, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know why um, Bloop has references to SBT because it, Bloop is built with SBT, and it uses parts of SBT that were in Zinc. If you know Zinc, Zinc was the incremental compiler part of SBT. So Bloop uses that, which may be in an SBT package. I, I, I don't honestly know what these things do, but as you can see, I leave, I leave in fact, that whole section blank because it's just not really necessary. Um, this can compile Scala.js or Scala native as well. So Bloop has that capability. Um, I've not added it to Fury yet, but it's just a matter of me generating the right file. Yeah. Uh, so without the dependency on Scala compiler, we actually get Scala compiler here. So this file has references to some jar files, yeah. which are the, the jar files that make up the compiler. Right. When Bloop sees those, when it reads the file, it, it knows. Um, but we didn't specify any compiler. Ah, oh, right, we didn't. No. Um, that's because it's, it's all hacked at the moment. So the, 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 the compiler, um, what, what I used to do is I, I, I required users to specify compilers that were on their hard disk as binaries. And you would specify the folder, and then um, it, it would use that and then put put the references to those in, in the build file. That was working fine, except it was bad for distribution. When you distribute a build, you need to know that the same compiler is being used as the one that was used when the person who wrote the build file ran it. So I had to do something better. So that, that was why I've changed. But it, it, it's incomplete at the moment. So that's why you see those. Uh, there's nitpicking here. Sorry. It's fine. No, you're, you're pretty good at finding the, the things I hadn't intended you to see or notice at least. Anyway, um, what was I saying before that? Was anyone listening? Uh, I, I, I wasn't. Yeah. Bloop. So, so yeah, I use, I use Bloop. Bloop, um, Bloop makes all of this possible. It's very fast. I, I actually use, um, if, if I go into 
Fury, I have all of these. This, this is my development folder. This is where I do all my work um, in order to build Fury. I don't use Fury to build Fury yet, but I do use Bloop. So if I, if I just show you, this, these, these are handwritten JSON files for Bloop that allow me to compile, uh, to, to, to compile all of Fury. And I, I can actually, this, this is sort of a, a, I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent, but I can, I can say bloop compile um, fury. Actually, I won't, I won't do fury because it might mess up my class path, but let's pick another project. And I can do something like that. Bloop will then go and compile it. It's uh, pretty fast normally. Interesting output there, but never mind. So that, 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 that is the sort of output you get from Bloop. And consequently, when, when Fury is tied up correctly with compiling, that's what you'd get when you call Fury build. OK, uh, so I talked about Bloop. I still wanted to demonstrate um, external repositories. So uh, let's, let's try and build something like Shapeless. You OK? Yeah, so I, I won't be able to do it because building isn't quite working yet. But um, let's add a new project. There it is. Uh, I don't care about the license. I'm just going to add a module. There's the module, and what I, what I want to do is define the build here in, in this workspace, but I want to refer to sources that are in a GitHub repository. So in order to do that, I need to, I need to tell, uh, tell Fury where that repository is. And Repositories are associated with, associated with a schema. And a schema corresponds very much to a cross-build in SBT. So you have many schemas. You may have many schemas. You start with just one. And that's, that's what it looks like. It's always called default to begin with. And it has just the local repository to start with. You maybe have a schema for Scala 2.12 and a different schema for Scala 2.11. Maybe you support Scala 2.10, so you have another one for that. Maybe you have one for Scala JS. And the idea is that schemas will be defined in terms of small variations from a, a, common, uh, a common build. So maybe for my, my Scala 2.11 version of Shapeless, I need slightly different sources. I need some additional sources on the class path that provide some shims, maybe, to make it compile on Scala 2.11. Maybe my Scala 2.13 or my Scala JS versions are different. The design of schemas, which isn't, isn't complete yet, is it's meant to make editing that and maintaining those builds as easy as possible, considering that there are some changes which are global and some which are specific to the schema. Of course, if you only have one schema, if you're only targeting one platform, then everything is very easy, everything is in default. But that, that, that is why schemas exist. And I mentioned that repositories are associated with the schema. So you might have uh, the shapeless repository. In fact, let's, let's just import the shapeless repository. So uh, to do that, we add a repo. And I'm going to use dash r to specify what that is. Now, there's no tab completion here, because who knows what's out there on the internet. But you, you do get shorthand, um, a shorthand way of defining a GitHub 
uh, or Bitbucket or GitLab repository. So what I can do is add that repository there. And what, what that will do, uh, there's an error. Oh, I, um, I can fix this actually. If I do that, that was the last time I did it when I was at Buildo. Um, What I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to make this uh, repository a remote repository on, on my on my GitHub account just uh, to get past this error. So um, why do you need this? Uh, because there's a bug. <laughs> um, it, it 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 shouldn't you, sh you shouldn't need to do this uh, until you actually want to publish something remotely. Um, essentially, it needs the origin to be set for the, the repository. And it wasn't set, so there was, it wasn't continuing. Um, by the way, there was, there was no stack trace, um, but the, the stack was, uh, oh, in this case, it wasn't. OK, so, sometimes it gets saved to a file, so you can actually view it afterwards without it filling your screen. But uh, if I run that command again, we can now see that we've got a local repository, which is so the the, the, pro the problem was it wasn't able to. It didn't know where the remote version of the local repository was, which is why this wasn't working. Um, and I added shapeless as a repository as well. Um, the name shapeless is orange. It's a repository. It's in a different namespace from the project shapeless. Um, it probably usually makes sense to call the repository the same name as the project, but you may have reasons not to do that. Um, you can also have projects refer to multiple different repositories and the same repository used in multiple different projects uh, as long as it's the same version. But there's nothing to stop you having two different repositories with different names that are different commits of the same remote repository, if that makes sense, different branches if you wanted to. Um, here we're referring to, to master, but I, I could have added a... Uh, a remote repository that had a different different version uh, or a different branch, and that would have been with dash uh, dash v, and you just specify a branch name there. So you didn't see this, but while I was talking, the shapeless repository got cloned, and what's quite nice is that uh, I've got my core module here, and I want to add the sources. What I can do is uh, I can add a source. And if I do a dash S and press tab, we immediately get a list of all of the projects in all of the, pro in all of the repositories that contain uh, Scala sources. So if you're, if you're trying to find the source files that you want to refer to in a remote repository, you just add the repository wait for it to download, and then you just specify with tab completion that, uh, well, we're, we're going to compile core for the JVM. So it's probably that folder that, uh, no, it's not that one. It's, you see, I, I, I don't know how Miles organizes all of this. So, so it's going to be core source main, and that something like that. I mean. You, you, you can check what's in there, but we've now got that uh, listed as the as the path that we're referring to. And I just I'll just show you this uh, show you this again. We could add something like cats. We can add a source. To that, the cats is actually quite large. I didn't think it was. Uh, I, I I can see that it's still downloading here. I've just got my network bandwidth visible. But the 
Maybe maybe there's a bit. No, no, the, um, the, but it's, it's a very good point. So at the moment, you can see that the version specified there is master. Now, at the moment, this build is for my own personal use. I'm not giving it to anybody else to use. So that's fine. I can, I can track master. But if I want to distribute this, if I want other people to depend on this, master changes, that's no good. So in order to publish, that master will get replaced by an actual commit version. So publishing, and I haven't said anything about publishing yet, but publishing will replace, uh, it'll even replace tags, tags or branches with the actual commit. And that's what, that's what um, you will distribute. There is still the risk that someone um, deletes a commit in a, uh, force pushes some, some, some change to the repository so the commit is no longer available. Um, that's a problem. Uh, I think the, the solution is less of a technical one and more of a, a social one in that if you are in a situation where you, your business absolutely depends on, on, on this, then um, take a local clone, take a local fork of the, um, that particular commit and maintain your own local copy, if, if it is that business critical. Or maybe a service evolves that makes sure that um, the committed versions available in certain builds are always available for all time and someone takes, I don't know, uh, right. Yeah. Not 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 ordinary tags because tags can change. You can you can force push a uh, a change to a tag. But um, do we have anything yet? I think it. I think it wasn't happy that I. Um, oh, I need to add. That's that's why it wasn't working. So, yeah, we've got loads of cat stuff there as well now. And you get tab completion all the way, and you can just specify precisely where the, the path is that you want to include. The thing that wasn't working before that I hoped would work was um, this, this local source. I don't know why it didn't work the first time, but it, it's there now. So uh, the, the, this isn't particularly well formatted. Those should be on separate lines. But we've, we've now got uh, the sources specified as these cat sources and these shaped sources. It's, obviously, this is a bit of a mess. I'm just adding, adding links and adding sources all over the place without really thinking about what they mean. But uh, hopefully, it demonstrates how it would work. Uh, transitive dependencies of Yep, so th there's, there's a whole load of things to say about this. So with, with binaries, transitive dependencies, I think, are probably reasonably straightforward in that I can tell Corsier, I don't know if you're familiar with Corsier, but it's like a downloader for Maven that, that works fast. Um, Corsier will deal with that because it has all the information available. But with... Um, with sources, obviously cats depends on, I think, uh, a variety of things. Uh, machinist, maybe, is one. Uh, kind projector, and maybe a couple of other. They're, they're all small projects. And what, what, I, what I want to do is um, to be able to depend on uh, um, external projects like Machinist or um, uh, Kind Projector. What uh, one thing I, I do need to say when you when you publish, I'll, I'll talk about publishing a bit. That that probably makes sense at this point. When you when you publish, 
you don't publish a project, you publish a workspace. Work, now, just, just to go over the structure again, a workspace is a collection of schemas. Each schema, each cross-build, is a collection of projects, and each project is a collection of modules. So one, you always have one workspace in a folder. The workspace is what you publish. It's a Git repository. You can share that. I can show you, I can show you this right now, actually. So notice there's a little star there, which indicates to me that in this Git repository, there are changes. I can call Fury Workspace Publish, and it would like to have a tag. Let's call it version 1.0. And it also needs a key, and I've got a few keys that I use here, so I'm going to use that one. Again, as always, we get to have completion. This interacts with GPG. And in order to publish, Fury will require that you sign the build with a key. So one thing Maven Central, for all its faults, does do is it does require that you sign absolutely everything. And the same is true of Fury when you publish. If I run this command, in the background is my GUI. You can't, you can't see it, but it's asking for a password. And I'm just try and type that in. And it's committed the tag, and it's pushed the Git repos repository. If anyone has um, their phone or computer out, I don't think anyone does, you can, you can check propensive slash KSUG test, I think it was called, and you'll see that that, that is now um, on the internet. It's available. It's published. That's it. You don't have to wait. Um, by the way, how many people here have published to Maven Central? So about six, seven. Um, was it easy or hard? Easy? Easy, but sometimes very slow. So, okay, easy, easy but sometimes slow. Um, hard and slow? Yeah, like norm normally it's hard and slow, or hard and not at all. Um, So I've, I've, I've just demonstrated how, how easy publishing is. And that's available for other people to use. You can tweet now to say that that is, that is live. The, the repository is available. And if I look in the, in the folder, we now have a, um, a dot sig. That, that's the sign. That's the signed, uh, uh, that, that's the signature for the, the build. And when someone wants to depend on a published repository, uh, they will, not, not, not quite yet, but they will be able to check and verify that that signature corresponds to the person who, uh, or check, check who, who it corresponds to. I understand that if you start from scratch with workspaces and you, and you depend on workspaces and modules that yeah. are published via Fury, it's OK, because then you start only with, with, uh, with sources. But let's mm. say you want to use Spark. I don't even want yeah, to think about Spark. And you start with Fury, you want to publish something that depends on Spark. Uh, do you actually, in order to, to use uh, libraries that are already out there, yeah. uh, are you the, is the only possibility to use uh, binaries? Because you, let's say you import the So, so when, when, you say, when you say publish, do you mean uh, do what I just did by tagging a, tagging a, a no, commit? You want to publish a you, binary. You, you want to use Cat's effect in your in your Fury project. Yeah. And this uh, implies, let's say, six uh, transitive dependencies. How do you, how do you manage that? So source dependencies. Uh, well. I, I guess I guess the question I'm asking is how how far into my hypothetical ideal world are we? Yeah. Or are we still in some transition phase between binaries and let's sources? Say that we so you, you want you want to you've got some you've got some source code that uses Cat's Effect, yeah, yeah. Um, and maybe Cat's Effect is available as a workspace on the internet for Fury. Maybe it's not. Um, maybe it's a binary. So if it's a binary, it's easy. We depend on the Maven binary. Corsier gives us transitive, so that, that that's all okay. Um, 
but if it's, if it's a source that already exists, this is what I want to show you next. Um, and this, isn't, this did, doesn't work as well as it did two weeks ago. But um, you, you should be able to see how, how it works. So um, these are my repositories. Now, the repositories here refer to source code. What I can do is have a repository that I manage in the same way. It's associated with the schema. But instead of containing source code, it contains a workspace. So uh, I can add a repository. It's in GitHub. And I've just called it base. Now, as always, that is downloading in the background. And, and when you, you might wonder where all this, where all this happens. If I, uh, if I show you the contents of the directory, there's a hidden directory here called Fury. And if I have a look inside dot .fury uh, repos, we can see that inside there we have base, which is the one I've just created. And um, it, 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 it's, it's, it's the published repository. It contains another workspace. And that workspace may refer to other workspaces, so you end up with a, with a chain of these. Um, but uh, here, here, is, here is the list. We've, we've now got that, that, uh, that, that base. I have, yeah. To use your library compiled by Fury, I need to use Fury in my project. Yeah. Because you are only publishing your structure. If, if I, yes, if you've, I've possibly. Maybe. I'm, I'll come to that later. I've got an idea. I don't know if it'll work, but I've got an idea for that. Um, but I need to finish answering the other question, which is how do we depend on external sources? So what I can do is, let me just get this right. I can, into my current schema, which is just the default one, I've only got one, I can ask to import uh, add now the import um, is of the form of a workspace, which is going to be base. Um, there's, there's currently no tab completion, but there will be as soon as it's possible, as soon as I've done it. Um, base and the schema. So that's going to be base code and default, because inside that published base, there is a default schema, that's the one I want to depend on in here. So this, um, there's nothing new here. The schemas for the current workspace are unchanged because these are just cross builds for the current, current set of projects. But we've now got a published version of my propensive collection of projects, which um, is a bit ugly here. But do you remember I showed you that other folder with all of the, the, the other projects? These are all in here. And I've just imported them by running this uh, schema import command here that, uh, that refers to the repository and brings those, brings those projects in. And what that means is that now um, if I select my simple project, the one we created at the beginning, I can add a uh, dependency now. Unfortunately, tab completion doesn't work here, but I, I can add a dependency on Magnolia Core, for example, which is a project that has become available to us. It's become available because I imported that 
that schema, that, that repository. Um, so I can run this command. We've now got a dependency on both core, which is the local project here, and also Magnolia core. And if all of the building worked, this would... Um, well, actually, what, what I can show you is I can describe this. So you can see now that we've got this link to Magnolia core. Maybe if I had the dependency on probation, let's add that one as well and see what the build looks like. Okay, this is getting a bit more interesting now. We're starting to see a, a graph that's more helpful. And I can keep adding these dependencies. I've got to be careful not to mistype these. So we've added contextual. Um, what other projects have I got? Kaleidoscope. There we are. And this is this is basically telling us what will what will happen during a compilation. And there might be some parallelism parallelism that can take place amongst amongst these. Um, Bloop will handle that for me. I don't need to worry about which of these can be compiled in parallel. Bloop will do that. So, to talk a little bit about your, your question, say you want cat's effect, and cat's effect depends on, depends on cats. We have, um, we would import the cat's effect workspace. I don't know who the, uh, who, do you know who the maintainer of Cat's Effect is? Luca? Oh, Jakob, Jakobovic. Okay. Alex. Okay. So he would publish his workspace. Now, in his workspace, in order for Cat's Effect to build, he must depend on Cat's. So he's already imported Cat's. He's defined all these repositories. He, he's done all of that. Uh, in, order to, uh, in order to get it to work. When he's happy with that, he publishes. And um, you, you effectively have a tree of workspaces depending on workspaces. We, defend, we depend on cat's effect. Cat's effect depends on cats. Cats depends on kind projector. Kind projector depends on Scala, perhaps. These are all overlays which pull in sources, which define projects, and we, we bring them all together. And once we've done that, in theory, we can build our project. And you can only, you can only publish when your builds are successful. Does that give you an idea as to how it might work? For, for, for a typical case, you don't have to think about the transitivity because anything that's published must build. If you import it, you can, you can then depend on it. But the workspaces you publish, and this is, this is an interesting, quite an interesting point. I, I anticipate there would be different kinds of workspaces. So for a project like uh, Magnolia, which is my project, it has no dependencies or no, no real dependencies. So I can just publish that. It's the Magnolia workspace. If you want to use Magnolia, you import that. Maybe you, you import a particular tag of that because you need a certain version, but you import the Magnolia repository. That, that, that's all great. But what about something like uh, Cats? When Cats publishes a workspace, it will have these additional few projects as well. So that's a workspace that contains not just one single project, but a, a small collection. Now, maybe type level, type level has about 50 projects now. Maybe they want to publish all of their projects together. So you can just import the type level workspace. Now, that doesn't mean you've got a dependency on all of those, all of those things, but you have the ability to depend on them at this point. So type level would be a big 
um, a big import. But because the, the projects are trying to work closely together, they're trying to um, be, be as compatible as possible, that would be a good, um, good collection to distribute as one workspace. And if you want to use Cats and Shapeless and Spire in the same project, that would be the obvious thing to do, rather than importing a Shapeless overlay, a Spire overlay, and a Cats overlay. Now, that's not to say that the type level overlay isn't defined in terms of those other ones, or in terms of specific versions of those other ones. It might be. It probably will be. What about importing two workspaces which uh, contain the same project? This is a perfect question, and I'm glad someone asked. This is, um, life would be wonderful if we didn't have to deal with this, but this, this, is, this is something that uh, is, is almost the, the reason why, or one reason why Fury exists, this, this sort of complexity. So yes, you could certainly have a situation where you, you import two workspaces. One depends on, oh, I don't know, let's say Spire 4, and one depends on, depends on Spire 5. We need, because package names are shared and we, we need stuff, we need the class path to be consistent, we, we need to resolve that problem. Because when we come to combine those, those class paths, we're going to have a problem if we have classes with the same name which have different, uh, dif different members. This will, be a, this will be a linking error. And within Fury, there, there, there's, there's a rule that any um, project name must be unique. You can't have two things called Spire which refer to different versions. So you're required to resolve that problem if you depend on it. You, you, can, you can import it, and if you don't depend on it, then fine, it's not going to be an issue. But uh, it, it's good practice to, um, well, it, it's necessary, in fact, to resolve those problems. So the question is, how do you, how do you resolve them? There's, there's a few ways of, of varying, varying convenience. Now, if it, if it wasn't, I don't know what version Spire has, but if it wasn't Spire 4 and Spire 5, say it was Spire 4 and Spire 4.0.2, you could probably hope that Eric Hochheim has been careful with um, Migration Manager and that those two are binary compatible. And you could say, just use 4.0.2 instead of 4.0.0. I still require you to make the decision explicitly. I don't assume that any particular semantic versioning exists. I, that, that's too much of a, an assumption to make. But you can specify it with a single command, and it will then replace every occurrence of 4.0.0 with 4.0.2. And hopefully, when you run the compiler, that will compile. If it doesn't compile, then there is a, there's a source compatibility issue, uh, and you can't you have to fix that some other way. But at least you know before you run it. You know before runtime, which is the most important thing. But if you do genuinely have two different projects, both depend on Spire, and they depend on different versions of Spire, this maybe has to be solved in a different way. Now, a diamond dependency problem looks like you've got your project down here and two other projects which you depend on. A and B, and both of those depend on C, different versions of C. But maybe in your project, you don't actually need to refer to C directly. None of the types that exist in C actually get used down here, perhaps. And in that case, what you could do is shade the, the binaries that are uh, have both versions of, of C compiled separately, but shade them so they're not visible downstream. Is anyone not familiar with shading? It's basically rewriting the package name and all references to it. Is it? Okay. So you, you, you are able to 
Right. It, it, it's, it's fiddly. Um, shading, I think, is normally done at the, um, uh, at the binary level. I don't think it's impossible to do it at the source level with something like ScalaFix. So that, that would potentially be a future way of doing it, where you just, we, we have, we would, um, by, by virtue of having all the sources, because we have to compile everything, because we're compiling Spire, just have both repositories available to us and run ScalaFix on both of them to change the package name and then have different imports in the dependencies. I, I, I don't know exactly how this will work, but it's, it's a possible solution. And I, I anticipate there may be a variety of possible solutions for fixing conflicts because it's, it's, it's going to be a common thing. It's going to be quite common that we end up with, with conflicts. Uh, so that, that, is another, that is another solution. So the first one was just pick, pick a version, hope it works. Uh, check that it works, should I say, not hope. Um, shading. We could also... Um, actually try and fix the problem. Now, we have all the sources available to us. So I've, got, I've got my projects A and B, both of which depend on C. And two versions of C are incompatible. Now, I can fix that in A by upgrading A to use the version that B uses. I can fix that in B in the opposite, in the opposite way. Uh, or maybe even I can modify C, the project we have two versions, or modify one version of it to support the old API or the new API. I could fork C in order to support both A and B. Now, most of the time when you're working with Fury, all of these sources are hidden away inside that .fury folder. They get cloned, they're available, the repositories are there, but you, you don't see them. But they're, they're still Git repositories. They're still, they're still sources. But you're not, the intention is not that you go, in, you go into the .fury folder and modify them and change them. But it would be quite possible to take that, take that folder we've already cloned behind the scenes, move it into your workspace, or just some other folder somewhere on your hard disk. Update all the links in Fury to point to that, that new one on the hard disk. And then you can play around with that. That's now in, in, your, in your workspace. You can, you can modify that. You can, change the, you can change the sources. You can do whatever is necessary in order to make stuff compile. Now, bear in mind, this is the desperation route. This is where, this is, this is where stuff, we, we, we can't shade, we can't, um, we can't just choose one version or the other. We, we're, we're forced to like, try and get a solution. Um, this, this is fixing problems that were close to impossible before. Um, so it is, it is difficult, it, it's, um, it's more complicated, but with a single command in Fury, you can do that. You can just specify a new location for any of your sources. And then you've got a Git repository. You can modify it, you can fix it, you can, you can, um, you can even do this while there's file watching going on. The file watching will check all of the dependencies and rebuild everything whenever it changes. And when you're happy, when you've finally got everything built, maybe that's time to go and create a pull request against the original project. Maybe you've actually helped the author. You can contribute back to the project. So it really makes it so much easier than it ever was before to upgrade stuff for people. If someone has forgotten to do the upgrade on, a particular, on, the, on their project, if they, if they haven't updated for a new API, you're no longer waiting for the author to do his or her binary publish on, on Maven Central, which may or may not work first time. You can go and do it yourself. Anything that was holding you up before with a binary being published. And in, 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 my, in my talk at um, ScalaSphere earlier this year, I made the point that there are, um, there's a big chain of projects that get released in order. The first one is always ScalaJS. 
Sebastian Zeren knows when Scala.js needs to be released, and it's immediately after Scala is released, a new version of Scala. Bill Venners knows that as soon as Scala.js is out, it's time for him to publish Scala test. They're fast, because they know they have to do it, because the whole world depends on them. And in, 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 the, in the talk previously, I, I, I point out that how, how, how the hell do we end up in this situation where we have a billion dollar industry, multi-billion dollar industry, depending on Scala, and we depend on a PhD student at EPFL to be publishing at the right time in order to save them waiting extra days for stuff to happen. This is, it, it's, it's kind of an outrageous situation that there is this pressure on Sebastian. He can't go on vacation when Scala is about to, about to be released because he knows he has to be there to push the button to publish it. So I want to remove all of that and, and make it as, as easy as possible, not necessarily to publish, but to create the pull request. And all, 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 the, all you need to do is, all they need to do then is merge the pull request. Or if you think it's acceptable, you just depend on the branch that that pull request is in. The branch is there, it's got to commit, just use that one. If you're happy with publishing something that depends on a possibly temporary branch, fine, go for it. Um, if people are happy depending on that, then that's up to them. So I, I anticipate all sorts of trade-offs and compromises happening when certain things become available or are not, not available. And there will be sort of give and take between um, authors and, and people helping out. But I, I anticipate it being, um, becoming easier and easier to get things upgraded quickly. I, what I really hope is that a, a spark built on Fury would not take three years to upgrade. It, it would be a week less, maybe. That, that, that's, my, that's my big hope. So, um, I've shown you a few things. Did I... Is there anything that you expect to see that I haven't shown yet? Because I think I might have covered. Sorry. Building. Well, building, it do doesn't. It doesn't work. Uh, so well, it, it, it calls out to um, calls out to bloop. Um, there, are, there are videos of it building online. So if, if you if you check out the, um, I I gave this talk in in Paris. A, couple of weeks ago and I think I, I did the talk in French but I think the demo was actually the demo might have been in, in French as well but um, the, quest, the questions were in English the um, there is there is a demo of of fury building and um, it, it you'll, you'll have to trust me it, it's it's as simple as typing fury build and it will build the current project um, what and then, is the biggest project that's already built? Um, biggest is the first module of CATS. So the so CATS is six or so modules. I think I think it was I can't remember actually. I think it was CATS core. Um, but the, the later modules required Kind Projector. Kind Projector required me to make plugins available. Plugins required a complete rewrite of a lot of stuff. So. Um, at that point, that was sort of a learning experiment. How much of this can I do? And um, I, I got quite a long way into, uh, into it, sort of fetching the repositories, um, specifying the sources. That, that was all working really well. And the only issue was I just couldn't specify the plugin or could, couldn't have the plugin built with the, uh, uh, the things it needed. So, I mean, it, it's, not, it's not a big project. CATS doesn't have particularly deep dependencies. Like I said, it was Machinist and Kind Projector and something else. Kind Projector built, but not as a plugin. Um, Fury has built itself at, at various points in its development. Um, it might be worth me, worth me saying, I mean, we're, we're, approaching, we're approaching 8 o'clock, so I don't really want to go, you've been sit, sat here for nearly two hours, so I don't want to go 
too much longer. But um, I did have another talk lined up as well over here somewhere, but let's not do that. <laughs> um, so the, the, the Fury project itself uh, is uh, not huge. And I've been quite proactive in trying to keep the source code very tight, very um, type safe, and small. And it's, it's under 2,500 lines of code for everything you've seen here. Um, with a few dependent projects. I mean, there's, there's uh, about 12 other generally tiny projects ranging from sort of 100 lines of code to 1,000. But t together it's quite small, very modular. And one advantage is that it's so easy to create new modules that you should do it. You should do it more often. You get better parallelism. You can get faster builds. The, the more granular you can make the, uh, the module definitions, the more opportunity Bloop has to parallelize compilations. Um, I've been, I won't show you any source code, but uh, I've been as, I've put as much effort as I can into making the source code something that other people can contribute to. They can read and understand. Um, And I, I, hope, I hope people will, mainly because it's, it's small and you're not having to try to understand 50,000 lines of code in order to understand Fury. It's 2,500. By the time it's finished, it'll be less than 4,000, I would hope. Um, I mentioned timescales at the, at the beginning. Um, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to get the things that were working before working again and I'll make a, a private, uh, private beta available. I, I, I don't want to make a public beta available to lots of people because I'm afraid they will use it and they will publish builds and there'll be a mistake, there'll be something wrong. And it's much easier for me as the, as the only developer to start with a, sm a, few sm uh, a small group of people get their feedback, and once that small group is happy, expand and expand and expand. And only then, um, once it's been demonstrated to work well, without too much confusion for a lot of people, open it up to more. Uh, so it's a little bit selfish, but um, I don't want to just drop this release, have everyone use it. And, and I also don't want to, uh, I mean, if, I don't know if you have this experience often, but if you want to use a library or any piece of software, you try it. If you're not happy with it, you won't go back to it the next day. You maybe wait six months before you try it again. I don't want to wait six months before you try again. I want you to use it and enjoy it the first time. I want to have a certain level of quality that means you can trust it from the outset. I don't want to put something out there that isn't, that isn't ready. So that, that's, the, that's the motivation behind being a little bit um, uh, less, less open about the development. But uh, that, that, that will change in a few months once it's, once it's out there. So any, any questions? Oh, there was a question about binaries. Can I publish binaries? I have an idea for how this might work. And what... So I, me I mentioned cross builds, um, and you, you define variations of a default, which all depend on, on sources, and maybe there are subtle changes. Maybe you use a different tag of a source repository, maybe you have additional source files, maybe you have a different choice of compiler. Um, these are all sort of single line changes or single, single thing, a single thing being changed in each, in each case. With binaries, sure, we could publish a fat jar of all of the things we build. It would be enormous, and it probably wouldn't be practical. You're shaking your head. It's correct. Um, 
but if we if we wanted to publish just a binary of the thing we are producing in order to do that we need to know the binaries it depends on and for maven central to accept those we need to know what the uh what what the binaries well basically the list of other maven central binaries it depends on my only solution to this would be to have a cross build if you really want to do a binary publish have a cross build that a schema, should I say, that substitutes the sources for some binary. So you remove the, you remove all of your source dependencies in your, in your cross-build variant, in your schema variant, and replace them with binaries. Now, Fury will still download those binaries. It will run the compilation. It will check that everything links. And then if that works, it should be possible, I think, to generate the Maven uh, POM file that's required to, to do the publish. It's not ideal, and I'm, I'm reluctant to make it too easy to maintain the status quo with binary publishing, because I, I think it's not a long-term solution. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a great, um, I don't think it's great for the, the ecosystem in general. I think it makes everything very, very slow, as I, as I said before. But my, my hope is that it would at least be possible for people who are prepared to put the effort in. And for projects like Scala Test, which doesn't have too many dependencies, Shapeless doesn't have too many dependencies, Cats, for them it would be, it would be reasonable. They could switch to Fury. They could have the, the builds they normally work on for development work um, that are all source-based. And work in this happy source dependency world until they need to do a release and then put a little bit of extra time in to switch the sources out for binaries in, in just one, in, in one, in one fork of this. And um, hopefully they, they, they can publish from there. What, what, what do you think of that? Does that, does that sound acceptable? Mm. Uh, this thing can produce final applications, which nobody uses, nobody depends on. Yeah. But if you want to produce a library, and someone else from other department mm. asks you, how can I use it? Yeah, and yeah. You must switch to it. Uh, uh, there's, there's a couple of solutions. Um, this is a problem. It, 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 it's a problem. Um, it, it, it depends. It, Bootstrapping any um, ecosystem is, is always going to be hard. I have one big advantage in that anyone can publish a build for anything. If I want to publish a build for Shapeless, I can do that. I just depend on the Shapeless repository with a particular commit hash, and I can publish that build, and then other people can, can use it. So if, um, I mean, I am not going to convince Miles or Bill or any probably anybody else, to go and stop using SBT, which they're like somewhere between accepting and happy with, um, and, and switch to something new that they're not familiar with. It's, it's just out of, it, it's not realistic for me to expect them to do that. But what I think I can do is I can persuade a few people that builds are easy to write. You saw how easily you could specify the sources for shapeless. If, if, I knew, if I knew more about what the Shapeless build actually contained, I could, I could probably knock it up in, in 10 minutes. I, I think I can persuade a few people to help me and some others publish, let's say, the 50 most, common, most commonly used projects for Scala. It would be a good exercise. Um, it wouldn't take too many people to do it. I mean, I, I, will, I will certainly want to do the, the, the top 20 at least myself. So with, with a bit more help, um, I think I can persuade enough people to start a new ecosystem forming around that. But your, your question was about in a large company and how a team could start using, using, using Fury. You can call Fury from SBT, in theory. It's just a shell command. So, so you, can, you, can, you can modify the build locally using calls to Fury, but then when you actually want to run the build, 
you could, uh, you could call that from SBT. And the call from SBT can run Fury to build everything it needs to, and then save the jar file, the resultant jar file, in the unmanaged uh, libraries file for SBT. And then SBT could continue from where Fury left off. So it, it's, a little bit, it's a little bit messy. Um, but if, if, you, if, you, if you are using SBT, I think it's, it's possible. It's not unreasonable that someone could write a, a plugin for SBT. I, I wouldn't do it myself. I don't know enough about the infrastructure. But someone could write a, a, a Fury plugin for SBT that allows you to um, invoke some Fury commands and put stuff onto the class path. Um, it sounds like a reasonably useful thing if, if people want to continue with SBT. Um, I thought I had another possible solution somewhere, but um, my, my, my goal is not to say there's only one solution to these things. I, I want to be versatile to support different ways of working. So I, I don't know um, I don't know if people will start using Make more. I don't know if people will want to continue using SBT. Um, I think a lot of people, particularly library uh, publishers, will want to use SBT for longer. And maybe they have Fury as well. Maybe Fury makes it easier to try things out. So let's say Scala 2.13 gets released in a couple of months. Nothing is published for Scala 2.13 yet. What, the, what SBT would require you to do is wait for all of your dependencies to be published before you can actually start experimenting with Scala 2.13. Now, if Fury existed, you could, you could have that running alongside your uh, SBT build. And you, can, you could play around for a while. You could see what the problems are. You could maybe like, put a bit of effort in to upgrade some, some dependency on the way that, 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 uh, that, that, that isn't, isn't working properly. And you, you, could, uh, you, you, could, you could consequently experiment very early where previously with SBT. So the community builds an, another interesting thing that would work really well with Fury. Um, I mentioned a, a sort of type level workspace which would have all of the, all of the type level projects um, consistent and resolved and without conflicts. The community build would potentially be like that but with more. Maybe the community build contains both Scala Z and type level stuff or other stuff as well. Um, that might be quite restrictive because you have this constraint that all projects must uniquely resolve or every, every project name must uniquely resolve to a project definition. That um, community build um, it w w would be actually a, a very, uh, would, be, would be very useful. So. You, you, could, you could import the community build and you get access to all sorts of projects you can depend on, but maybe they're slightly older versions. They're not the most recent versions because work is required to maintain this consistency. It's, n it's not dissimilar to Linux package managers that have some, uh, have stable versions of everything because they have to link everything. Um, they have to link all the versions you, in you install consistently. Um, you could always have the community build and import a, mo a more recent version of just one or two projects on top of that and resolve the projects. You, you resolve the conflict. Um, th th these, are all, these are all possibilities. But the other thing that would be really nice to do is, is if you... Um, uh, what was it? It was really nice, whatever it was. Uh, you could... My mind's gone blank. Uh, I shouldn't have said it was really nice, because I've forgotten what it was now. Um, what were we talking about? It's, it's, it's completely gone. Community build, 
Yes. The, say you are the author of a project that is commonly used. A lot of people depend on your project and you want to make some changes. You generally don't know how well those changes will be received. Let's say uh, you're Travis, you, you, you are the author of Circe. Lots of people depend on Circe. If you change the API, then there's 30 projects downstream of you that will no longer compile. So clone the repository build, or get, get the repository build, change Circe in there, and just see what works and see what doesn't work. Try and build everything. That's totally possible with, with Fury. Build everything, and maybe your API changes result in half the projects working, half them not working. Now, you've got a couple of options. Either you say, well, I don't care about the other half. I'm just going to publish this API breaking change anyway. Maybe you say, well, I really want this change, but it's going to affect a lot of people, and I care about them. So I'll, I'll actually go, and I'll fix their projects for them in advance of me making the breaking change. I'll go and fork them out of the managed space into my local workspace, my local hard disk, and I'll go and create pull requests to all of these projects that depend on Circe. That, that's totally within the realm of possibility. So it sort of makes it easier in both directions, both things you depend on and things that depend on you, to get a better visibility. Because we have access to the sources of everything now, we get better vis visibility of um, the, the entire ecosystem and the knock-on effects of, of changes. And it gives us the ability to contribute back. So seeing as, seeing as my, my brain is failing me, uh, I can maybe take one more question because it's, it's, gone, it's gone 8 o'clock now. So um, I want to ask you about this uh, workspace file, which, uh, as I understand, is being versioned along with the project. What was the? Workspace file. Work, workspace file. Workspace. This, this Fury. Uh, oh, work, 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 workspace. Yeah. So uh, you've mentioned that you wouldn't uh, see it as something that could be uh, changed, modified uh, directly by users. But if we think about a practical aspect when uh, more than one developers work on a project and they make concurrent changes, mm. and at some point they, they would want to merge together, and obviously they, there may be some conflict. Some yeah. Result automatically somewhat. So, what's your view on, on the practical issue of doing this kind of changes? Um, merges, you'll be lucky if they work. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they, they, they might. Uh, I mean, a lot of things in this file are. Um, this Um, yes, and uh, what I'm considering doing, because this, uh, the different schemas will be, like, say you've got seven or eight different schemas supporting Scala 2.11, 2.12, 2.13, Scala JS, Scala Native, and different versions of those, they're going to be 95% the same. Um, and I just feel a little bit uncomfortable from a technical point of view about storing, I mean, it's not a huge amount of data for this example here, but storing that seven or eight times, almost identical with just a few changes. Um, I'm considering having the, the other schemas be diffs maintained against this one. But realistically, this is what? 5k, 10k, probably less than that. Uh, it's sort of not worth it, um, apart from it just feels wrong to be duplicating a lot of the same data multiple times. Um, now, I could do it with a, with a line diff. I could do it with the file format itself, where, for example, I don't know if you can visualize this, but it's basically a tree. It's a tree where the branches are defined by 
tab indents. Um, you, you, could, you could have a diff that is literally the nodes that change. Um, again, I'm not sure if it's necessary or not, but um, uh, you're asking a slightly different question to begin with. How do you deal with merges? It, you, you, well, for, uh, for many of these, so lines, things like this here, I don't know if you can read this, but this is listing, uh, what is this? This is the dependencies. These are just uh, several lines in a, in a list. Um, that, that would actually merge quite nicely automatically. Um, by, by any of the methods I've described, either the file format or via a line diff. Um, it makes me nervous that people might do line-based line, line -based merges, though, so I, I should probably discourage it. Generally, um, there may be the possibility later on that Fury itself can tell you that... Well, no, the, I, I do intend this. I, I intend for some sort of explanation as to what the differences are between any two schemas. So we've got the default schema, which will be the, the one everything is based off. I want people to be able to say, list all of the differences in all of the projects, all of the modules, that everything that changes. Which repositories are using different, different um, commit hashes? Which source files are compiled for one particular cross version and not another? Uh, which, maybe even which modules exist only in, like maybe Scala.js has some additional modules. The, this, is, this is useful feedback for understanding the build. And that's a general theme, actually, that um, understanding the build is really important. It's not just writing it and maintaining it. It's, it's being able to clone the repository and immediately understand what, what is going to be built, what is going to work, what's not going to work. Uh, what, what's, what's going to be compiled, what's not going to be compiled. And I think the, the, nice, the nice graph with the lines, that's maybe number one most useful thing in understanding the build. Uh, and I think number two, if you, if you are in a situation where you're doing cross builds, showing the differences between, between each of them is probably uh, also very important and very useful for maintenance. Uh, typically, the, um, once you do have multiple schemas, any change you make can either be made universally to all of them, or it can be made to just one of the variants. And um, that, that will be specified at the, at the command line. So if, you're, if, you, if you think of the sort of changes that are required when, when working on a, on a build, if you add a new module, you probably want that module to exist on all different schemas. If, if it's new source code that's being added, a new, a new module, then it equally deserves to exist on Scala 2.11 as 2.12. If you're upgrading to the most recent version of a source repository, that's probably something that you only want to happen on maybe the Scala 2.13 branch. So there are decisions to be made. and. Um, all of the commands you saw will be, can, can, can be tuned with a, an additional flag to say, is this global or is this uh, particular to the, to the schema? So I'm, I'm, unless anyone has a really good question, I'm going to stop there. Unless this is something really obvious I haven't, I haven't explained, I'm going to say we've, we've done an hour and so two, two hours, 10 minutes. And, uh, I will say uh, thank you for coming and, and, uh, and good night. <laughs>